All right, so let's just start with the basics. Why should Michiganders reelect you to be their top law enforcement officer? Well, I've worked so hard over the last four years to put together cases and initiatives that are just helpful to your everyday Michigander. So whether it's some of our new units that we have in the office, our elder abuse task force, where we tackle um, serious crimes of, of abuse, neglect, and economic exploitation against seniors, our work on opioids, you know, we've already brought in $820 million to the state of Michigan from our lawsuits against opioid manufacturers and distributors to try to help those people who are still suffering from addiction. Uh, we're helping workers. We have a uh, payroll fraud uh, unit that just concentrates on assisting workers who have been ripped off. They've been denied their tips or overtime, or they're being misclassified. They are being called independent contractors when really they're employees who should be getting medical and retirement benefits. Just recently, we released the first of our seven reports on um, the Catholic Church uh, investigation and clergy abuse. Uh, we released our Marquette report. We have six more to go. Um, we have more prosecutions and more successful prosecutions and convictions than any other state that's looked into clergy abuse in their state. And we just announced our first conviction on our massive Boy Scouts of America sexual abuse uh, investigation. We're the only state in the country that's doing that. We're reviewing 5,000 claims of abuse. So the list goes on and on as to the kinds of work that we're doing that has never been done in the history of this office before. But even more so, you know, we have more on the line now than we've ever had. So our hate crimes and domestic terrorism unit, we were the first of its kind anywhere in the country and it was incredibly necessary due to the exponential rise in hate crimes against minority communities and also acts of domestic terrorism. We have uh, stopped an unknown number of murders in this state due to our prosecution of groups like the base who were planning mass carnage, um, but before they could actually injure a single person, we prosecuted them and they're in prison now or our prosecutions against the Wolverine Watchmen. We've already convicted you know, three individuals. We have another five who are gonna be scheduled for trial soon, um, trying to protect not just elected officials, but just regular people in our state. Um, and then you have the issue of reproductive rights, which is very much at the forefront of people's thoughts and minds right now because we always had protections under Roe v. Wade. Well, obviously we don't anymore. So my office has fought vigorously to ensure that you know women of reproductive age maintain rights that we've had in the state for nearly 50 years. Uh, and if proposal three passes, I'm going to aggressively defend uh, a woman's right to choose and to make her own medical decisions uh, instead of somebody in Lansing or a politician in Washington, D.C. My, op my opponent won't. He won't defend Prop 3 if it passes at all. And even if it were to fail, I'm going to continue the lawsuits that are already in action right now that will end up before the Michigan Supreme Court to ensure that women uh, retain that important right. We'll but, touch more on uh, Prop yeah. 3 in a moment. Um, I want to circle back to crime. What do you believe is Michigan's most pressing issue with crime and uh, what can you do going forward to improve upon it? Well, the biggest problem is the proliferation of firearms in our state. Um, that's what's causing violent crime, right? It's, it's due to, uh, to weapons. The fact that anyone, any place, anywhere, any time, just about can access a deadly firearm. So I have worked aggressively on this issue. And of course, I've supported things like safe and secure storage, red flag laws, uh, increasing the age from 18 to 21 for a person to be able to purchase a firearm. My opponent is very different. He believes there should be no restrictions on firearms at all of any kind, which is the most extreme thing I've ever heard from a candidate who's seeking to be the top law enforcement official in the state. But we have new units that address these things, right? So we have the Organized Retail Crime Unit that started October 1st. Uh, again, a first of its kind in the nation. And that addresses those uh, very scary smash and grabs that maybe sometimes people see on TV. Um, I've testified multiple times in front of the legislature to ensure that we could have uh, more significant penalties. And we are now working with federal law enforcement, state, local, and you know we're putting together MOUs, um, memorandums of understanding with other AG's offices all over the country because we know that with criminal activity like this, what happens in Michigan 
doesn't always stay in Michigan. We want to be able to pursue these cases even when it crosses state lines. So we've been very aggressive with that, but we have other kinds of programs that we know actually reduce uh, recidivism and ensure that people won't commit crimes again. So we start with low-level offenders and my job courts program, where as a diversionary program for people who get into the system, non-assaultive, low-level crimes, that instead of going to jail or prison, they're immediately put into a program where they get job training and they're placed into a job. Because what we know is this, for those individuals who are able to maintain long-term employment, they are far less likely to reoffend because now they have a job uh, and a good paying job with benefits. And what I always say is the most dangerous person out there is a person who's got nothing to lose. So for those offenders, we're giving them something to lose and we think it's going to be a phenomenally successful program. I'm really excited about it. There's such a polarized debate, an ongoing debate, about the role of policing, whether reform is warranted. Where do you stand on that issue? Well, firstly, I've been clear from the very beginning that I oppose any effort to defund the police. Yes, I absolutely support adding to police departments social workers, psychologists. I mean, that's essential. It's crucial. But what we can't do is take money away from our police departments. And if anything, we need to make sure that police officers are paid better and that they have better benefits, including medical and retirement benefits. So I've fought for that from the very, very beginning, and I'm going to continue to fight for that. We need to make sure not just that we're doing a better job of recruiting, but also retaining members of law enforcement. At the same time, I've worked hard to hold law enforcement accountable when they violate the law. So on one hand, we want to support law enforcement when they're doing what they ought to be doing, but we want to hold them accountable uh, in the event that they commit you know, transgressions against the public. And I've done both of those things. Let's talk about elections. Um, obviously, it's a huge point of conversation. Your opponent has made it uh, a prominent uh, talking point on the campaign trail. There are others out there who believe the claims he has made, that there was fraud uh, permeating the entire Michigan election system. What do you say to the people who believe that, the people who don't know what to believe because there's so much conflicting information out there, uh, both about the integrity of the last election and the one we're, we're getting ready to participate in? Well, first, I think we have to focus on the fact that one of the biggest election deniers uh, in American history is now seeking to be the person who would be in charge of defending the will of the voters in Michigan. I mean, this is a person who conspired with the Trump campaign to try to decertify the results of a lawful election in the state of Michigan. You know, he's an incredibly corrupt individual, and it's possible that, you know, if voters are not aware of what's at stake at this election, he could be in a position to ensure that in future elections that he will substitute the candidate of his choice for the candidate that the voters choose. You know, this is a person who has spread an enormous amount of lies, misinformation, disinformation about the 2020 election he is still, to this day, trying to decertify the results of the 2020 election. He believes that Donald Trump won, not Joe Biden. He's incredibly, not just unqualified for this office, but it's scary. What I'm here to say is this, having spent such a lengthy period of time defending the will of the voters, defending the lawful results of the 2020 election, it's incredibly important that we not put people in these important offices, both to administer our elections, but also to support our elections in court and to have somebody there who wants to disenfranchise voters and who has said himself that he believes that no votes, no absentee ballot votes should count if it's after 8 p.m. the night of the election. Can you imagine the hundreds of thousands of people who would never have their votes counted at all if Matthew DiPerno becomes the attorney general of this state? That should concern everyone. So if there are claims of fraud or other misdeeds in this upcoming election, how do you plan to respond? We will do what we always do. We investigate any claim of fraud. And the fact is, we have pursued cases. Um, in fact, just in terms of clerks alone, you know, we prosecuted the Southfield City clerk. We prosecuted the deputy clerk uh, in Flint. I mean, when we see that there are issues, we take aggressive action. But what I'm not going to stand for is you know, the dissemination of just lies about our, uh, about our election system. And as we know, we have the most safe and secure elections anywhere. 
Uh, and if you didn't think that before 2020, you should think that now because we had the 250 audits that were required by the Michigan Constitution. We've had county after county where we've had independent audits. And in fact, in Antrim County, the case where my opponent brought his lawsuit, I think it's important to remember that there was a recount of the paper ballots and they found that there were very few discrepancies between what the tabulators showed and what the recount was of the actual paper ballots. So it's not just that we can think it's, you know, that it's possible that my opponent was lying about everything he said about Antrim County and about tabulators. We know it for a fact because of the recounting of the individual ballots. So, you know, it's this kind of disinformation that I think is incredibly damaging to our democracy and we can't have election deniers who still don't believe uh, that Joe Biden is the rightful and lawful president in the United States take the positions of governor, attorney general, and secretary of state in the state of Michigan. And that's what we're looking right now, all on the Republican side. And yet your opponent does maintain that the investigation, as far as it relates to him, is entirely politically motivated. What do you say to that? Well, if that were the case, then why did I refer everything to the uh, prosecuting attorneys coordinating council for them to assign to another prosecutor. I would have just kept that myself. The fact is, when that investigation came into my office, we had no idea that it would lead directly to Matthew DiPerno. Uh, what we knew and what the, had been widely reported by the press is that there were a number of election tabulators from a number of different municipalities up north and on the west side of the state uh, that came into possession into the hands of third parties who had no legal authority to have those tabulators. And when it became clear that Matthew DiPerno was involved in all of this, I did exactly what every prosecutor ought to do, and I referred it out, and I said, I can't handle this case anymore. And that's why Prosecutor DJ Hilson in Muskegon County is handling this. I will have no say in whether or not charges are brought, and if they are, what those charges are. Uh, and it will be up to a jury at that point to make that decision. Uh, so that is exactly the way that when you look at prosecutorial ethics, uh, the way they're designed, I followed it the, to the letter of the law. Do you have any concerns about any potential fraud or tactics that might be used a week from now? Well, we're already seeing it, right? I mean, uh, Christina Caramo, the um, you know nominee for the Republicans for Secretary of State, I mean, she brought a lawsuit to essentially disenfranchise all the voters in Detroit who decided to vote absentee. I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of people, potentially. It's outrageous. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that the Republicans who are running for these offices subscribe to. I believe that every eligible voter ought to have the opportunity to vote. And when they do, that their vote counts. And I also believe that people should be able to vote without threat of fear, of intimidation, of harassment. Um, I'm very afraid that the Republicans will be encouraging all of that because at the end of the day, they don't want everyone to vote and they don't want everyone's vote to count. And that is not how we run a democracy in this state or in this country. If the votes are counted and the people of Michigan do choose DiPerno, will you accept that outcome? Absolutely. That's, that's what a democracy is, you know? And if he wins, absolutely. I will concede to him and I will wish him well and I will hope that he will take good care of the Department of Attorney General and the people of the state of Michigan. Uh, but what I'm most interested, of course, is making sure that everyone does have that opportunity to vote and that their votes are counted. Uh, we have to talk about Flint. Your office has said it will exhaust any and all options to continue pursuing this case. Um, what options are, are left? Well, I mean, again, let's make it perfectly clear that when I came into office, I absolutely had to choose either the civil cases or the criminal cases. And the reason for that is because I could not at one time, you know, be defending state actors that were involved in what happened under my predecessor's uh, regime under Schutte and Snyder. Um, I could not be defending those individuals in lawsuits, but then also on the other side, criminally prosecuting them. So we erected a conflict wall, which had been in place. I took the civil side and we don't really hear much about the fact that I settled those civil cases in short order, which I was one of the things that I had committed to do during the last campaign. It was the largest settlement in the history of the state of Michigan, and I had to get it through a Republican legislature, which is not always very friendly to places like the city of Flint, but we did. 
On the criminal side, I appointed uh, my Solicitor General, Fadwa Hamoud, and Wayne County Prosecutor, Kim Worthy. And I trusted that they would do the best job they possibly could. But what's important for people to know is this. Uh, you know, nothing that you've heard about in regard to these prosecutions has to do with the evidence against Rick Snyder or the evidence against anyone who was charged. It was all about the procedure that was used, which is a procedure, of course, that had been in place in this state for decades and decades, the one-man grand jury. So any of the findings of the court had nothing to do with the evidence. I think the evidence should be heard in a court of law and that the people of the state of Flint ought to have their day in court and whatever evidence there is against any of these individuals, um, you know, it should be brought before a jury at some point so that a jury can make that decision. Is that still a realistic possibility when you consider the statute of limitations in regard to some parts of the case? Well, I guess that's going to be left for the courts to decide. Okay, um, who do you believe deserves the blame for, on the criminal side, the, the failure? Who do you think that blame should be owned by? Well, when you say who deserves the blame, I mean, uh, you know, S.G. Hamoud and, uh, and Prosecutor Worthy, they did everything that they ought to have done, what they, you know, what had been the law for decades and decades, and they followed a procedure that had been in place forever. How could they possibly know or understand that the Supreme Court would rule that this procedure that had been in place for all of these years and had been used over the course of decades for hundreds, thousands of individuals who had been indicted and convicted would not apply somehow to these, you know, high-level Republican operatives? Uh, let's talk about the height of the pandemic, the governor's COVID policies, you know, obviously you were tasked with enforcing them, uh, some of them not so popular. Uh, what went into your mindset at the time? Did you have a choice? Could you have pursued uh, those enforcement tactics any differently? Well, first of all, I, when I hear the Republicans talk about the pandemic, it's as though we didn't have tens of thousands of people die in this state. It's as though we didn't have over a million people die nationally from uh, this novel virus, this once in a century pandemic. We know that the governor's orders saved the lives of tens of thousands of Michigan residents. Uh, but I will say this, you know, we worked very hard in our office on the price gouging front. You know, I had to reassign many of my special agents and my assistant AGs to make sure that people could afford just their di daily items that they needed to stay safe and they needed to stay alive. Things like face masks and disinfectant uh, and even you know household staples like uh, chicken and beef. So we worked our very hardest to make sure that people could make it through the pandemic even at a time uh, where many people were not working. So we worked industriously during that time period to help as many people as we possibly could. And in regard to the, you know, the executive orders by the governor, again, you know, I will say she was following the law. For the very first time ever, uh, the high court found that the uh, emergency powers of the governor, uh, governor act was, you know, illegal, but that was a four to three ruling along partisan lines that might come out very different, by the way, if it was heard by today's court. But again, if you're following a law that's been in place for decades and decades and decades, and you're just doing what every previous governor has done, you have no way of knowing that at some point uh, a court of law may say that that law can no longer be enforced. Now, how about the, the decision not to investigate the nursing home deaths? Why not at least look into it, if, if for anything, for no other reason than to give the appearance that you're going to investigate regardless of political party. Because there have to, there has to be information that's provided to us that there was a crime committed. We actually, you know, we took in all the complaints that were made and we said, give us your information. If you have information that you had a loved one that died in a nursing home as a result of, the, uh, of anything the governor did, let us know. But you know what? We didn't get complaints like that. And let me say this. First of all, it's not just that the governor's policy that people talk about never actually went into effect, which it did not. But I remember when uh, Pete Lacido was running for Macomb County prosecutor, and he said he was running so that he could take action against the governor. But guess how many cases he's brought against the governor in relation to any nursing home deaths? Mm. Zero. You know why? Because there wasn't any evidence to support that. So I have always said that if there is evidence against whether it's the governor, whether it's the mayor of Detroit, whether it's any Democrat in office, 
I will absolutely take action to investigate, and if there is evidence there, I will prosecute. Um, but there was simply no evidence to suggest that here. And I will say this, if you look at the people that I've prosecuted in office, I have prosecuted a whole lot of Democrats and no Republicans. So to call my prosecutions partisan, uh, I think is really laughable when you look at the high level Democrats that I've gone after um, that perhaps another Democratic Attorney General would not have. All right, you can't turn on your TV for a few minutes or look at the internet for more than a few minutes without seeing or hearing the drag queen in every classroom comment or joke, which you have stated multiple times it was a joke. My question for you is, is the state's top law enforcement officer someone Michiganders need to be hearing jokes and sarcasm from? Well, I think it really speaks to just how little the Republicans have in the way of anything useful that they can use to say that I haven't done my job and I haven't done it well. When they have to take a single joke that was made in response, by the way, to the Republicans asserting that what was the biggest danger to school children was drag queens, it completely ignoring the fact that so many kids are killed every year by firearms. I mean, that itself is a joke. That itself is laughable to make that suggestion. So to say that you can take any remark that I've ever made or that anyone else in elected office has ever made out of context and somehow turn it into a policy, um, that really speaks to how little the Republicans have in the way of actual policies. They only have wedge issues. They have ways to divide us. If you look at my record, I stand by my record, and I've done so many things to help the everyday lives of just regular Michiganders in this state. The fact that they have to take something like that and use it against me speaks to how little else they have. On that same note, it's been such a contentious race, a lot of mudslinging. Um, the tailgate photo was kind of handed to the opposition. Why post Wait, something like that? It was that? kind of handed. Or it was public. I put that up myself. Right, why? Okay, that was a cell phone to say, you know what? Everybody makes mistakes. I went to a single football game where I had a couple too many, and that was really just a couple, uh, and I didn't feel good, and I went home. And I heard later on something about it, and so I said, you know what? I'm just going to tell everybody what happened because I wanted to be as transparent as possible. And that's what my time in office has been all about, just being as transparent as possible. So if the worst thing you can say about me is that one time I went to a Michigan-Michigan State game, had too much to drink, didn't feel well, went home and did it responsibly, uh, then I'll own that. And if people don't want to vote for me because I one time drank too much at a tailgate, well, then I guess they're going to completely ignore everything I've done in office that have helped people. But again, if you're going to take things like this and say that somehow, you know, when you weigh against all the things that I've done for workers, for students, for veterans, uh, for minority communities, for voters, for all the different groups of people who have really benefited under my work as attorney general and say, yeah, but that one time she had too much to drink at a football game. I think it's really just somebody who doesn't want to see me back in office, not because of any of the things that I've done in office, um, but because that's just a person who's finding an excuse not to vote for me, not based on any of the substance of my work. Considering the distraction from the issues from both that photo and the, the joke about the classrooms, would that change if you are reelected going forward? Will this color how, how transparent or joking you might w be willing to be in the future? Look, my plan is to continue all of my great initiatives in office that have helped so many people. And whether that's fighting against robocalls, I mean, I don't hear anybody talking about the fact that we have substantially fewer robocalls that are made to Michigan residents now than they were in 2019. But that's a way that you affect a person's everyday life. The fact that seniors now can't lose their entire life savings just because they accidentally fell for a scam uh, that got texted to them or a robocall or an email. I mean, like that's a big difference in a person's life from how things were when I came into office and how things are now. For uh, residents who identify as LGBTQ, they can't be fired from their jobs anymore just because they're gay or because they're transgender. That's 500,000 people in this state that can't lose their jobs anymore because of work that I did. I mean, that's a real difference in a person's life. And those are the kinds of things that I think people should focus on. Do you have any concerns about any of your achievements in office? Um, are they vulnerable if you're not reelected? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, here I've been talking about 
you know, our Boy Scouts of America sexual abuse uh, investigation and our clergy abuse investigation. Remember, these are, we're talking about not hundreds, but thousands of victims and hundreds and hundreds of dangerous predators that we've investigated. My uh, opponent won't even discuss these investigations. And I think it's clear that he's going to drop both of these investigations. And that's a whole lot of victims that will now never see justice if he comes into office. Uh, he has basically committed to dropping the Wolverine Washman cases. Remember, there's five more cases out there for individuals that are accused of having lent material support to aid and abet in acts of domestic terrorism. Those cases will just go away. In fact, he'll drop the entire unit. My entire hate crimes and domestic terrorism unit, God knows how many lives we've saved or how many lives will be lost if Matthew DiPerno is elected and he abolishes this unit altogether. What about our ongoing opioid cases, our, our case against Walgreens, which is scheduled for trial in early 2023? He hasn't committed to even continuing that case. So we have so many important cases that are in the system right now that frankly, I, I think a lot of my work will just be completely obliterated uh, and much of the progress that we've made will simply be you know, thrown in the garbage. Uh, let's talk about the ballot proposals. Um, we'll just kind of go down the line. Uh, starting with Prop 1, tell me if you support or oppose it and why. I support it. I think there needs to be greater transparency in office for uh, elected office holders so that there's no conflicts of interest. Um, and also, I, I believe in this increase in terms in the House and Senate for members. And I say that because, you know, I've seen firsthand how the legislature works. And, you know, six years in the state house, for instance, it's simply not enough time to understand the issues. And when we see such a massive turnover uh, every single session, you're starting with at least a third of the legislature who has no idea uh, about any of these issues. And just even for me having to explain to them some of the issues that we've been working on, for them to have to sort of start all over again, um, I think is dangerous. Remember, we're talking about a person who becomes Speaker of the House after they've only served for four years. Could you imagine, you know, a, if you were going to a surgeon, let's say, for a, a really difficult operation, would you want someone who had no more than four years of experience to be operating on you? Or would you want somebody who had a little bit more experience than that? And I think the same goes true, is true for the legislature, and I think we need to expand and extend those terms. All right, how about Proposal 2? I absolutely support Proposal 2. I think it's incredibly important that we enshrine uh, these crucial voting rights into the Constitution to make sure that uh, a later legislature or governor can never remove those rights. Um, more voting rights equals a better democracy. The more people that participate in our democracy and the easier that they're able to participate in their democracy, I think the more fair, equal, and just society we live in. Uh, if Prop 2 fails, would you still pursue some or all of the measures contained within it? I think you're going to have to explain what you mean to me by that. Uh, if it fails, I mean, as far as uh, absentee voting, sending them to everyone, are there any parts of, of Prop 2 that you'd be in favor of pursuing anyway? Well, when you say pursuing, I mean, I, I enforce the laws. So are you asking me if I was in the legislature what I would do? Or if there are efforts from the legislature, would you support them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for instance, drop boxes. I think uh, drop boxes are incredibly important. Um, they're, you know, a, a level of convenience that we need to provide to voters. I remember my very first election I voted in, um, uh, I had to stand in line for three and a half hours to vote. And for a lot of people, they don't have three and a half hours to stand in line to vote for the president of the United States. Uh, and they shouldn't have to. So that's the kind of thing where, you know, I would hate to see uh, a future legislature decide, well, we're going to do away with those altogether. So, you know, should it be constitutionally enshrined? Absolutely. All right. And speaking of constitutional enshrining, Prop 3, where do you stand on it and why? Well, I think everyone knows and I've made very clear that I uh, am a firm supporter of Proposition 3. And let's remember that as the 1931 law that bans abortion uh, in our state is written. I mean, it's not just that there's no exceptions for rape, no exceptions for incest, no exception to preserve the health of the woman, not even uh, under many circumstances do doctors understand how it could be utilized to save a woman's life. And we have so many situations where we know that doctors don't know 
how they would handle it. If you have uh, an ectopic pregnancy, if there is a woman who's diagnosed with preeclampsia, which many women are, other emergency situations. When we went uh, to court in Oakland County in defense of the governor's case to ensure that we could get a preliminary injunction so that the 1931 law could not go into place, all of our expert witnesses were physicians. They were OBGYNs. They were emergency room doctors, uh, the chief medical officer of the state of Michigan. They all said the same thing. We don't know how to define saving a woman's life as the only exception. And so what they said is this, I mean, does there have to be a 50% chance that she's gonna die? 60% chance, 70% chance? Like what has to be the exact percent chance of a woman dying for us to be able to terminate a pregnancy? Even if we know that that's a pregnancy that's never gonna be viable in the first place. And most doctors have said this, I'm so afraid of getting prosecuted. I'm so afraid of going to jail or prison or even just losing my license to practice. I think I'm just gonna have to let that woman die rather than perform a procedure that I don't know if I'm gonna be prosecuted for or not. I mean, we are talking about the maternal mortality rate rising in the state of Michigan over 20% just because doctors won't be able to save women's lives because they don't know under what circumstances they're able to do that. But there's so much more to it than that. Of course, it's not just abortion rights. We're also talking about birth control, which of course my opponent has said he would ban Plan B. He would treat it like illegal fentanyl shipments at the border. Um, it would provide us, of course, the assurance that birth control would always be legal in Michigan, which is a right that might be taken away soon. Also, the ability to manage miscarriages, you know, whether that's through uh, typical procedures like DNCs or DEs or through medication. Um, women need to know that if they have a miscarriage, they don't have to go into sepsis, you know, they don't have to die because they had a miscarriage and somebody's too afraid to provide them with the medication or the surgical procedure that they need uh, to make sure that they, you know, their health doesn't suffer and that they can remain fertile. And um, infertility treatments, I mean, my opponent has said, on the record, he has said there's nothing more important than a fertilized egg. Well, what does he think that IVF is? IVS is creating fertilized eggs uh, and then, you know, sometimes implanting them into a woman's body so that she can become pregnant if she has challenges to getting pregnant. Well, is that going to be considered manslaughter or murder in this state? I think it will be if my opponent has his way. I think these are all things that are decisions to be made between a woman and her health care provider, her doctor, uh, her family her faith, not decisions to be made by politicians, and certainly not a decision to be made by a prosecutor deciding whether or not to prosecute that woman or not. Uh, so I firmly support Proposal 3, but there's more to it than that. If Proposal 3 passes, are we going to have an AG that's going to aggressively defend that law, or will we have somebody like my opponent who will refuse to? Uh, that was actually my next question. If it does pass, we really want to give voters an idea of what they're likely to get whichever way the race goes in whichever way Prop 3 goes. So if it does pass, uh, do you expect challenges? What, what is the plan after that? Does anything else need to be done if you're reelected? Well, we know there are going to be challenges, right? If there were the kind of challenges that were made before it even made the ballot, even though it was by far the most popular ballot proposal, uh, I think in the history of the state of Michigan, in terms of the number of signatures it received, it will certainly be challenged after it passes, no matter how much it passes by and you're gonna need an attorney general who will aggressively defend proposal three. And that's what I'll do. If it doesn't pass, we're gonna continue with the lawsuits that have been filed, and I am going to aggressively defend a woman's right to choose, which means even if the case goes all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court, which it is expected to, I will be there arguing that women, doctors, nurses should not be legally prosecuted, criminally prosecuted for something that should be a decision that they get to make. Okay. Uh, in this highly partisan environment, um, how do you plan to earn the trust of independent and right-leaning, far-right voters? Well, I think it's a combination of things. First of all, so much of the work that I've done has been, I don't want to call it bipartisan, it's, it's nonpartisan. You know, again, you know, protecting students who are being scammed by somebody who's trying to get their information uh, when they're a student loan borrower. Uh, you know, seniors 
who have been uh, abused or neglected, you know, people who are suffering from the opioid epidemic. I mean, these are not issues that are Democratic issues or Republican issues. You know, these are just human issues. And I've been there every step of the way to work across the aisle and to make sure that just people are best protected in this state. But on the other hand, I mean, find something out about my opponent. I mean, this is a person who has multiple grievances that are pending before the Attorney Grievance Commission. He's been accused of, of padding billing. He's been uh, fired from law firms for misconduct. He's been accused of uh, assaulting his own elderly clients. Uh, you know, obviously the Antrim County lawsuits. We know that these were vexatious lawsuits. They had no merit. Even Bill Barr, the former uh, Attorney General of the United States of America, a Trump appointee, said himself that this was a ridiculous lawsuit. Um, my opponent is a person that should be nowhere near the office of Michigan Attorney General. And if he is, I think people have something to be really concerned about. Do you think the Attorney General's office has a role to play in turning down the temperature, the rhetoric that we have seen escalate even recently um, around the country, but even in Michigan? Do you think your office has a part to play in calming those waters? When you say calming the waters, I mean, I think my hate crimes unit uh, is a big part of that, right? We have so many uh, elected officials or members of minority communities that are under threat every single day. Um, I, I will tell you quite honestly, I was on a Zoom this morning from uh, an individual who threatened um, my life and the life of my children. I think it's important to hold people accountable when they are threatening other people. Uh, it's not okay, it's not appropriate, and also it's not legal. Uh, and I think we really need to ensure that people feel like they're protected and that you know they're not going to be subjected to threats and they not, are not going to be subjected to violent acts. And that is my job as the top law enforcement official of the state, is for people to know that everybody's lives are protected. And by the way, that includes many Republicans uh, who we have protected, who we have prosecuted those who have threatened them. And maybe it doesn't get a lot of attention because when I have a, we have a very victim-centered approach in our office, and if I have a victim who says, I don't want any media or attention around this issue, we don't put out a press release on it. But I certainly have also been involved in protecting the lives of Republican officials in the state, and I'm going to continue to do that. Uh, if there's anybody that threatens the lives of our state residents, you know, we're going to do everything we can to ensure that people are held accountable. And on that same note of, of lowering the temperature, and I did ask DePerno this as well, is there anything genuinely positive you can say about your opponent? No. Full stop. I don't, I don't, know, where to, I don't know what to say. I mean, this is a guy who has made disparaging remarks about me uh, based on my sexual orientation. He routinely mean tweets at me all day long on Twitter. Um, on a typical day, I will do six, seven, eight events whereas he'll have six or seven or eight mean tweets about me. He, I've never seen a person um, behave this way who wasn't really just a middle school bully. I don't think anybody should be in elected office who behaves the way that my opponent behaves. So if you're asking me to say something positive about him, it's a struggle for me. Yeah, he, you know, he commented and said he knew the game he got into and understood. He said things have been said about his own family that he didn't find to be above board. Do you think this is politics going forward or is there any hope for a, a more civil tone? Wait, he said things have been said about his family? Yeah, I he didn't say specifically. Well, I've never heard anything said about his family and I've never said anything about his family. Um, but he sure has had a lot to say about mine and I find that to be despicable. All right. Issue number one, the one thing you want voters to keep in mind as they're heading to the polls or filling out their, their ballots. Well, I think they should want to have people in office that protect their rights. And again, irrespective of who they are, where they're from, what side of the state they're on, uh, you know, what their national origin is or their religion or any of those factors, they need to know that they have an attorney general who is looking out for them in every way, shape, and form. And that's what I'm doing. And that includes their right to vote and that includes ensuring that their vote counts. And that's what I provide to this office and that's what I'm gonna to continue to provide. All right, anything else you wanna to touch on today? I don't think so. All right, thanks so much for coming by.